Hello, with me today is Professor Richard Bell and he's going to explore with us the significance of doing theology with Richard Wagner, the great 19th century German composer. Richard, you're very welcome. Okay, doing theology with Richard Wagner, please. Okay, okay. it might not seem an obvious thing to do, doing theology with Richard Wagner. No, it doesn't seem no, very no. obvious. Because as soon as you mention Richard Wagner, you think of like Norse helmets, you think of murder on the stage, incest. And then, of course, when you look at the life of Richard Wagner himself, a rather problematic uh, character, clearly uh, an anti-Semite to some extent, rather lacks sexual morals. So you may immediately think, why on earth do theology with Richard Wagner? And uh, I'm, I'm a, a Christian theologian, and sometimes when people are, you know, ask me, well, why on earth uh, do you want to do it with Richard Wagner? Uh, and, and I would have to say, well, actually, I think he makes an important theological contribution. And uh, perhaps I can just say something about the development of uh, you know, Wagner's thought regarding theology. In the early stage, in around about the 1840s, he wrote three uh, operas, uh, you could call them romantic operas, The Flying Dutchman, Tannhäuser and Lohengrin. And each of these actually has a theological message. Um, after writing Lohengrin, he then wrote sketches for a drama, Jesus of Nazareth. We don't know if this was going to become an opera or a play, but these are actually quite detailed sketches. And in preparing for these sketches, he actually studied the New Testament in some depth. He was reading recent New Testament scholarship. For example, he read the book by David Friedrich Strauss on the life of Jesus. And he produced these sketches, which really have got a certain theological profundity. Uh, one of the striking things about this play is that there's no resurrection. So Jesus dies as he dies, the Holy Spirit is given, and you get the, the, this pattern you, you may find in John's Gospels, so the Holy Spirit is given as Jesus dies. The disciples then go out and then preach the message of Jesus, and one of the central messages is that his death is an atonement for sin, it's a sacrifice for sin. So we find that in the 1840s. After that, uh, Wagner was involved in the Dresden uprising in 1849, he had to go into exile, and he wrote a number of theoretical essays. Uh, and in some of these essays, one might get the impression he was actually highly critical of Christianity. But in fact, the problem he had was the institutional church. He had this fascination with the person of Jesus of Nazareth, but he had a problem with the institutional church, particularly the, the Catholic Church. Uh, and I'm afraid to say, so Tommy described the Catholic Church as the universal pest. All right. So he was a very, very strong Protestant. And then there was another shift in his thinking from, from 1845. And this is when he discovered the, the, the work of the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer. Arthur Schopenhauer was very, very interested in St. Paul, Augustine and Luther, and it's partly because these thinkers, these Christian thinkers, emphasise the bondage of the will, and this very much fitted in nicely with Schopenhauer's deterministic uh, view of the human person. Uh, but the other thing is that Arthur Schopenhauer was very, very interested in the death of Christ, and in a way this deepened Wagner's appreciation of the death of Christ and, the, and the, the way in which his death actually dealt with sin and turned with sin. So he had that period where he was um, toying with the ideas of Arthur Schopenhauer that much fed, fed very much into uh, the opera Tristan and Isolde. And then towards the end of his life, in the last 10 years, he took an extreme interest in the work of Martin Luther. So we know from his uh, library, he, he, uh, towards the end of his life, he lived in Bayreuth in a house called Varnfried. And in this library, it had a, a collection of works of Martin Luther. And we know from the diaries of his wife, his second wife, Cosima, that they would often read uh, something like the life of Martin Luther or, or, or read the, the, the works of Martin Luther. And this interest in Luther was then to have a profound influence upon his final work, and that's Parsifal. Uh, Parsifal was completed in uh, 1882. And when you look at Parsifal, you actually see a work really of some, again, theological profundity. 
And I suppose one of the key ideas that comes over in Parsifal is that the human being is actually helpless, cannot help himself, and is really entirely dependent upon the grace of God. So this is an example where we actually see the, the influence of Martin Luther. So that's one of the messages, I think, of Parsifal. This idea of, I suppose, what we'd call original sin. So that's one of the things he stresses in this. Another thing he stresses in Parsifal is the significance of the death of Christ. Um, again, he doesn't have a resurrection of Christ in Parsifal. So we saw the, 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 this also in his sketches for Jesus of Nazareth. He doesn't have a resurrection, but somehow Jesus nevertheless lives on in the community. So there's a wonderful line in the libretto where, where you have, um, he lives in us through his death. So he doesn't live on in the community here of the Knights of the Grail through his resurrection, but it's rather through his death. And what is very, very interesting, therefore, is that for Wagner, Jesus of Nazareth was not simply a figure of the past. Okay, he has no resurrection, but he has this feeling that Jesus Christ nevertheless lives on in the community. It, does that mean, in, in a sense, that, you know, the... the, the, the this pro very problematic area of, of German thought in the 19th and early 20th centuries, Volkisch thought. Mm. The idea that the people live on from the great heroes of the past, is that really... Uh, it, the, it strikes me that to leave out the preaching of the resurrection, which is the original Evangelion, the yeah. original gospel, strikes me that he's almost uh, he's almost reducing Christianity to the structures of Volkish thought that the people the people become the incarnation of the the, the heroic the heroes of the past right that's interesting to be honest I had never actually thought of that before but I don't think it's as simple as that. Okay. Uh, and I think the reason it's not quite so simple is that I think he was really grappling with some of St. Paul's teaching about the suffering of Christ and the death of Christ and how the Christian community is somehow related to that. So if you look at the way in which Paul talk, talks about his suffering in things like 2 Corinthians and so on, it's quite clear that he had this sense of this communion with Christ through his suffering. So I don't think it can be simply reduced mm -hmm. to that folkish idea you're talking about. But when we actually stand back and we look at Richard Wagner and ask, you know, what message does he have to give to the theologian? I think it will be this. What he's saying is that if you want to understand anything of God, you have to start with the person of Jesus Christ, especially Jesus Christ crucified, and you work out from there in concentric circles. Whereas, of course, what happens today in the debate with the new atheists and so on is that you talk about some abstract theism or a God out there, and then you try to work out. And if possible, we see if you can fit Jesus Christ into this picture. And the genius, I think, of Wagner, and of course you find this in Luther and in St. Paul, is that you have to start and end with the person of Jesus Christ. Richard, thank you very much. Thank you very much.